Good morning. Really cool to have you all here, and happy Friday. Uh, for those of you with lab today, today at 1 o'clock, 1.10, actually, we'll do the class presentation thing. You'll all give it in front of just the group in 2501. Uh, it should be about five-ish minutes. You'll turn in your paper that goes along with it, as well as the Kinetics One Lab. So it should be pretty cool. I've loved the presentations I've seen so far. Someone gave a great presentation on chlorophyll, and it was really neat, and how magnesium was in the middle. Still thinking about copper in the middle, and the type that you buy from the store to consume. But anyway, it's a really cool. There's been lots of really neat presentations, and I'm looking forward to all of your presentations, too. So. Uh, any questions on that before we start? Cool. Uh, the reason that reactions uh, are sometimes slow and fast is because of differences in what's called the energy of activation or activation energy. And you can literally think about it as a barrier, all right? So for example, uh, for those of you that can see this, if I wanted to jump over my remote control, no problem, even I have it. That's pretty chill, don't have to worry about that, all right? On the other hand, if I need to get to Clifford, I need to go to the table. <laughs> well, this takes my uh, body a little bit extra to get over, but I can do it and stuff and say, hey man, what's up? So uh, the differences in energy of activation there versus my little remote control versus me being a moron and jumping over the table. That would be an example of took a little bit longer. All right, it was easy for me to step over the remote control. It was harder for me to step over the bench and stuff to see Clifford. And that's why really reactions are fast and slow. Now, so far we have seen reaction diagrams which we looked at uh, on Wednesday. And if this is reactants and the right is products, this is an energy axis, by the way. The energy of activation is literally like a hump that has to be gone over to conform, to turn the reactants into products. And all chemical reactions have this. And all chemical reactions have a positive energy of activation. And at first that might seem a little strange, but if you had a negative energy of activation, there would be literally no barrier going from reactants to products. So thankfully, there is a little bit of energy of activation for all reactions. An example of that are bodies made of DNA and carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. Well, energetically, it's all destined one day to be basically CO2 and water, the combustion reaction we talked about in Chem 221. Fortunately, there's a large energy of activation to get our DNA turned into CO2 and water, so none of us have to worry about uh, turning into CO2 and water unless you believe in spontaneous combustion, which, by the way, is an interesting topic for a class presentation of Chem 223. Sorry for the advertisement. Anyway, energy of activation is important for these reactions. And as you change the temperature, you then have more energy to overcome it. So this is a graph, something like what we looked at with the gas laws chapter. We have a blue uh, colder line and a red warmer line. All right, and this amount of energy is the energy required to go from reactants to products to get over that energy of activation barrier. Um, at the colder temperature, you do have some molecules with enough energy to do it, but by far most of them don't have the energy to go from reactants to products. As you start increasing the temperature, then you have a larger percentage of molecules able to overcome these barriers. So that's why almost always reactions are faster at warmer temperatures and slower temperatures uh, because they have different things like that. Any questions on any of that? Okay, um, so one thing that's really important then is being able to calculate the energy of activation. How high is the barrier? And a scientist named Arrhenius, now that's how I've always been told it was pronounced, although I guess at U of O they're pronouncing it differently, whatever. I don't know, I can't even speak my own language. So anyway, Arrhenius is what I'm gonna say. Arrhenius created this equation which actually has the energy of activation, E sub A, in it, all right? And what this relationship shows is that the energy of activation is related to the rate constants K, and there's a temperature dependence in there as well. Now, 
big R here is the gas constant R, but it's the version in joules per mole Kelvin. Don't use the 0 0.082057 number. Use the 8.3145 number. You can also use 8.3145 times 10 to the minus third kilojoules per mole Kelvin. That's fine. But it's the energy R, one version of that. And another thing here we'll talk about in a little bit is something called the frequency factor A. Now, this is uh, the anti-natural log, the little e to the x button that's used. And this is one form of the Arrhenius equation. But what I would recommend focusing on is what happens when you take the Arrhenius equation and you take the natural log of it. Now, I know that sounds about as much fun as watching paint dry, but here's the advantage. Natural log and E cancel out. So EA over RT, which is what this part is right here, then is just a number. And if you do the natural log of all this stuff, you end up with natural log of K and natural log of A. And if you're still like, Russell, where's the punchline here? This doesn't look very cool. Well, this is actually the equation for a straight line. Y equals AX plus B. Y is the natural log of K. That's going to be the Y axis. The X axis will be 1 over the Kelvin temperature. And if you plot these values, these rate constants versus the inverse of temperature, you're going to get a straight line. And that straight line is super, super helpful. The slope equals minus EA over R. R, remember, is just 8.3145. So you multiply your slope by minus R, you'll get an E sub A value, always a positive number. That's how scientists find these energies of activation or activation energies. Uh, so plotting, linear regression, all that jazz, oh yeah, <laughs> it's important and stuff like that. And in the kinetics part two lab, that's what we'll be after. We'll be after the E sub A value. Now you can also find this frequency factor, and I'm just going to mention it in passing here in a little bit. Um, for us right now, it's not as helpful, but if you get to higher types of chemistry, woohoo, it's pretty cool. So, punchline, all right? If you have a bunch of rate constants at different temperatures, and remember rate constants K change with temperature, you can plot natural log of K on the Y axis and one over the Kelvin temperature on the X axis. And you should get a nice straight line with a negative slope and that slope equals minus EA over R, where R is the energy R. E sub A is the energy of activation. And that'll tell you if you just have to jump over a remote control or if you have to jump over a desk and stuff to get where you want to go. Questions on that? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I know. Okay. Now, frequency factor A is something that scientists are still debating what exactly it means. But in my opinion, the best version of what frequency factor is, is this expression right here. So people have thought about this y-intercept value and what it means for a reaction. And it, it's really interesting. Um, here's the R, the energy R. Delta S is actually a thermodynamic quality called entropy. And we'll talk about entropy more in Chem 223, but it's popping up. Um, this little guy is K sub B. It's the Boltzmann constant. It's the energy uh, R value, but per atom. <laughs> you don't need to know that, but it's just one of those things. Planck's constant we saw in Chem 221. Here it is again. Um, people aren't totally sure uh, like what A represents. But people do think that the entropy of activation has something to do with how fast and slow reactions go too. So you will never have to do anything with this slide, but I do want you to know that A has a use, all right? And if you really are interested in something like this, you could look up online some more information. But for everybody else on a practical level, just this is information only. Is that cool? Yes. Now, Energies of activation help us to understand and predict uh, good reaction mechanisms, which is how reactants go to products. And sometimes when a reactant goes to product, it's a single step, like A plus B smashed together to make C, single reaction. Sometimes though you have a couple of steps. 
So a good mechanism uh, will correlate with the energy of activation. So what we're going to do now is explore what exactly a reaction mechanism is all about. If a mechanism has more than one con a combination, they're called elementary steps. And a lot of reactions are just reactants going to products in a single step. But once in a while, you will have more than one step. The fluoride ion approaches a methyl chloride molecule. A bond begins to form between the fluoride and the carbon. The molecule's carbon-chlorine bond lengthens and becomes weaker. The energy of the system increases. As the carbon-fluoride bond forms and the carbon-chlorine breaks, a configuration of maximum energy is reached, called the transition state. As the reaction proceeds to completion, the energy of the system decreases. This is a reaction you'll look at if you take organic chemistry one day, and essentially the fluoride is pushing the chloride out uh, around the carbon, all right? And they feel that this is a single step, like the fluoride essentially smashes into the carbon and the chloride is kicked out the other side. Uh, this is, and they think it's pretty well known. Um, first of all, some terms. Fluoride is smashing into the CH3Cl. So there's two pieces coming together. That's what they call a bimolecular reaction. And bi just means two, all right? So in this mechanism, two pieces are coming together. This would be bimolecular. Um, as another reminder, if you look at where reactants and products are, products here are lower than where the reactants started. If the products are lower, this would mean it's an exothermic reaction. If it was endothermic, the products would be higher than the reactants. They would be like up here and stuff like that. Uh, finally, at this top part, the mechanism allows you to see like why it's such a high energy. And the part I was trying to circle there was it was carbon with five bonds. Now at the beginning of Chem 222, if you would have drawn carbon with five bonds, do you think I, as your instructor, would have been happy or... Mm -hmm. You don't have to say anything. Yeah, I would have been bumped out, right? Because, oh, carbon, period two, never has DSP3s and stuff like that. It's always tetrahedral and less, which means four bonds. But here I'm showing you a picture with carbon with five bonds, all right? That's what's so weird about these transition states, all right? They're super high energy. They're not the normal way that we expect chemicals to be. And it certainly doesn't last very long. Once you make that five coordinate carbon, it wants to kick something out big time. So it kicks the chloride out in this case to make the new compound. But you will see some really bizarre structures. You'll see like atoms bonded to double bonds, the pi bonds and molecules and stuff. Very, very strange kind of stuff. So this is an example of a mechanism. It's a single step. It's a bimolecular reaction because two pieces are coming together. And this mechanism is exothermic uh, because the products are lower than the reactants. Question. All right. There's unimolecular, bimolecular, and termolecular. Una means one piece is coming together. Bimolecular means two pieces are coming together. Termolecular means there's three. And you might think, well, why is it there a tetramolecular? Well, here's the reason. Let's say that uh, there's that. Uh, new movie with the guy fighting the dinosaurs out now, uh, six, it's called 65 or something like that. And I said, oh, I want to go see this. All right, well, if it's just me, I can look at my own calendar. I know it up here, more or less. I could go any time. But then I say, oh, Clifford, you want to go see the movie? He goes, oh, yeah, sure. But, oh, Clifford's working this afternoon. So, okay, no problem. We'll find a time on Saturday. So it's a little bit more difficult, but it's totally doable. But then Kaylin says, oh, I want to go. And we're like, heck yeah, Kaylin, come along. But, oh, Kaylin's out of town until Sunday at a beach conference or whatever you do on the weekends, I don't know. But anyway, it harder it gets harder and harder to coordinate three people. And then, you know, Claire wants to go and it's even more difficult. And then everybody wants to go and we might as well just watch it when it comes streaming later on or something. But anyway, it's it harder and harder to get those molecules to come together in the right energy and the right orientation. So honestly, I've never seen a mechanism which was more than termolecular. I wouldn't be surprised 
surprised if it exists, but it, I'm sure it's very, very rare. Um, so most of the time, I've only seen unimolecular and bimolecular, much more common. Um, here are some examples of how this works. It could be a single molecule just breaking down. That would be a unimolecular. Um, bimolecular is when two pieces come together, but it might even be two of the same pieces. So like two hydrogens coming together, smashing up or something like that. Um, oxygen going to ozone would be an example of that. Two O2 molecules kind of smash together to make other stuff. That would be bimolecular. But you could have two pieces coming together, like hydrogen and chlorine making HCl or something, and you could have different combinations. If this is an elementary reaction, i.e. if it's part of a mechanism, then the orders in the rate law will equal the number of reactants. So notice when there was one reactant A, it was a first order A experience. On the other hand, here's two A's coming together. That would be a second order because it takes two of them to make something happen. If you have A and B coming together, then you'd have first order A and first order B, etc., etc. et cetera. In our chemistry kinetics one lab from last week, uh, hopefully you're seeing that you've, you're getting a first order roughly acetone and a first order HCl. And that just means that it takes one HCl and one acetone to smash together to make the party start, all right? Um, you can literally use the rate law to help you understand what the steps are and stuff in the mechanism. Okay. Often, you'll have more than one elementary step to give the overall reaction. And what that usually means is to, to make us reaction start, you have to have two reactants come together with the right energy and orientation to make something happen. And those subsequent things will make the overall reaction possible. Now in Chem 221, I believe we talked very briefly about two ozone molecules coming together to make three oxygens. And this has been a reaction that's been studied a lot because ozone depletion, that kind of jazz. They feel that this reaction is a two-step elementary system. It's a sequences of steps. And the first step is unimolecular. It just takes one ozone to break down into oxygen and an oxygen atom. That's pretty hard to do because ozone is somewhat stable, but it does happen. And once you have the oxygen atom by itself, it will react with the second ozone to make two oxygens. If you add these two steps together, you get the kinds of reactions we've been talking about since Chem 221. So two ozones make one plus two, three oxygens. And you can see that this oxygen atom, which appeared, is then used up in the second sequence. So this is an example of the value of a mechanism. It'll tell you how the ozones go to oxygens. And it's not just two ozones smashing together, apparently. It takes one ozone to break up to O2, an oxygen atom, and that oxygen atom reacts with an ozone molecule. Gaseous ozone decomposes in two steps. First, one oxygen atom splits off. Next, the single oxygen atom reacts with a second ozone molecule to produce two molecules of O2. The product of the overall reaction is three O2 molecules. Cool. If we were to draw a reaction diagram for this mechanism, this is kind of what it would look like. Now, earlier I drew a reaction diagram for a single step, and notice there was like a single hump. But this thing has two steps, so you're going to have two humps. So one thing I want you to see is that each of these humps represents a step in the mechanism. So if I didn't tell you this, and I just showed you this, and I said, how many steps would you have? Well, two humps, two steps. If I showed you this picture and I said, how many steps? You'd say one step, all right? So literally the number of humps equals the number of steps. 
If you look at these humps, this first one has a lot higher energy of activation, the gap from there to there, than the second one. And that tells the chemist that, yeah, this first step is going to be kind of difficult to do. All right. Once you make this, the second step is pretty chill. That's a much lower energy barrier. So we're going to see that there's lots of uses for these reaction coordinates, but the important part is that the number of steps equal the number of pumps. Hydrazine is formed in aqueous solution in a three-step process, each step being bimolecular. First, a molecule of ammonia reacts with a hypochlorite ion to form chloramine and a hydroxide ion. Next, the chloramine reacts with a second molecule of ammonia to form a charged species with a nitrogen-nitrogen bond. Finally, the charged species reacts with a hydroxide ion to form hydrazine and water. There are lots of reasons why you don't want to add bleach to your cleaning products at your house, all right? And one of the many reasons, and there are several, is that you have the potential to make hydrazine. And hydrazine is like a rocket fuel. There's a lot of energy inside this thing, and you don't want to be messing around with hydrazine unless you know what you're doing. Um, this is why uh, the bleach, which is essentially a hypochlorite source, reacts with ammonia, which is in your cleaners. And they feel it's a three-step process, one, two, three humps once again, okay? And the first step is the hardest because you have to have the ammonia and the bleach come together. It makes a compound called chloramine, which is super nasty. You don't want to be around chloramine. Fortunately, I guess, chloramine reacts pretty readily with another ammonia to make some kind of protonated hydrazine thing, and that's pretty unstable, so it reacts with hydroxide to make the hydrazine itself. So again, three elementary steps make three humps on the reaction. This is overall exothermic because products are lower than reactants. The first step is the hardest one to get started, all right, but once you do, it's good. And then finally, you can see the molecularity. Um, all of these are bimolecular, two pieces coming together to make something else. Any questions? Okay, <clears throat> so one thing that's really important for us in this class is you need to figure out which of those humps has the highest energy of activation. And that highest energy of activation will be the hardest thing to overcome if you want your reactants to go to products. So the highest hump on the diagram has a fancy name. It's called the rate determining step, the RDS. And all that means is that it takes the most energy to get over that step. And one thing that's super useful about a rate law, if you've studied it for a reaction, is the rate law tells you the chemicals that are involved in the rate determining step. So this is a reaction where iodide reacts with hydrogen peroxide and a little acid. <laughs> Excuse me. It makes iodine and water. This is called the clock reaction. And when people study this, they find that iodide is first order and hydrogen peroxide is first order. And why this is cool is because this part here tells us that in the slowest step in the RDS, you're going to have one iodide and one hydrogen peroxide coming together. Now, who knows what happens after that, but that's the value of finding the orders of your reaction. They tell you what the slow steps are. So scientists have studied this reaction quite a bit. And let's say that this scientist has proposed a three-step mechanism, all right? So the slow step has to have one iodide and one H2O2, and that's what we see right here. So the scientists predicts they react to make HOI and hydroxide. This is hypoiodous acid. It's very unstable. It reacts with iodide to make iodine and some base. And then these two hydroxides react with acid to make water. Well, if we are questioning the scientist's mechanism, there's a couple of things to think about. 
First of all, the slow step must match the rate law, and that looks good because the rate law has one iodide and one H2O2, and that's what the first order parts are saying there. You need like one iodide and one H2O2 to make it happen. Notice that acid was not part of the rate law, all right? It doesn't mean the acid's not important, it just means A, that it's a zero order reactant that's not part of the slow step, and B, if it's not part of the slow step, it means that H plus was used in one of the subsequent steps. Sure enough, it's in step three. So it's not that the acid isn't important, it's just that the acid didn't have do anything until one of the subsequent steps. And the other thing I want to point out here is that in the stoichiometry of this reaction, there were two I's and one H2O2, but the rate law was just one I and one H2O2. So these numbers are not necessarily the numbers you're going to see in the rate law. So we don't see H plus to the second power in the rate law at all because H plus is part of a fast step. Only the slow step shows up in the rate law. So here's an example, all right? The reaction of NO2 and CO is thought to occur in two steps. The first step has two NO2s coming together to make nitrogen monoxide and NO3. And then NO3, which is actually kind of unstable, reacts with the CO to make CO2 and another NO2. So the question is, if we're proposing that this is a good mechanism, what must be the rate law? And to answer this, you look, you make sure you gravitate right away towards the slow step. And whatever the reactants are in your slow step, they will be expressed in the rate law. So does the slow step have any CO at all? No. Slow step has just NO2 coming together with itself, all right? So CO should not be part of the rate law. And in fact, you should see if two NO2s are coming together, you should see that NO2 is a second order reactant. And that's, again, not what you'd expect from the overall reaction. Now, notice that CO, then, is not appearing in the rate law. So if CO doesn't appear, what must be the order of reaction with regard to CO here? Zero. Zero. Nice job. That's right. Zero order reactant. Okay. So let's kind of step back here for a second. The rate law. When you figure it out, whatever reactants, whatever go into it, the rate law will give you a hint as to what's happening in the slow step of a mechanism, all right? And you might have a chemical like CO here, which is not part of your rate law, all right? Well, chemicals that don't appear are zero order. They don't affect how fast the reaction is. They're still important. You can't make CO2 without CO, all right? But when it turns to the speed, uh, CO would be a zero order reactant. It's part of the fast step, not the slow step. Questions? It might be wrong, but no. by chance, does zero order mean like it's readily available or no? Yeah, well, um, you could argue that, uh, like if it's zero order, you'll have some kind of slow step and then a a smaller hump, all right? And so the energy of activation, this amount, is a lot smaller than this amount. This was the slow step energy of activation. So yeah, so if it's if it's not if it's not if it's zero order, it just means it's a lot easier to make that reaction happen. Okay? Whatever the slow step is, which is where you have non-zero order reactants, then you have a much bigger gap and stuff to open. Yeah, that's a good question. Question. So, step one is bimolecular. H2O2 and iodide are coming together. And if it's the slow step, then our rate law should have first order iodide and first order H2O2. 
and that one and one mean that one of each of them are coming together in the slow step to do whatever they're going to do. And that's totally what we see in this one. So in this case then, yeah, one H2O2 and one iodide means first order iodide and first order H2O2. Now again, if you looked at the stoichiometry, you would think H2O2 first order is okay, but you'd think maybe iodide was second order and acid, H plus would be second order. Well, H plus is zero order and iodide is only first order because in that slow step, that's when the two things come together to make the other jazz. HOI appears and then disappears in this mechanism, as well as hydroxide. Like we didn't add a source of hydroxide in the reactant side, yet hydroxide appears and then disappears. And hydroxide and HOI are called reaction intermediates. And if you're trying to prove your mechanism to the science world, sometimes detection of these intermediates can be like a feather in your cap, all right? So let's say that John and I are doing this reaction and we're proposing it, all right? And then Mara says, no, you guys are smoking, <laughs> all right? That's like too silly, right? Well, maybe John and I can use laser spectroscopy or one of these kind of things, which are really good about finding molecules that are just around for like a femtosecond. And if we could find evidence of HOI, that would be like, yeah, I think we've got a good mechanism. You know, on the other hand, if we don't, then Mara would be right, which is cool. Now, hydroxide might be a little easier because hydroxide is a base, and you can sometimes detect bases a little easier than you could HOI. But I bring up these reaction intermediates because sometimes you can kind of prove your mechanism if you can detect these kind of species. So. If you're bored this weekend, don't throw tomatoes at me, but in the companion and online, there's a reaction mechanisms guide, and it goes over this stuff in a little bit more detail, because I know some of this stuff is kind of new, and it's totally reasonable and doable, but it does at first take a little bit of thinking. So if you have nothing else to do, and you want to check it out. Cool. Here's another example. <clears throat> All right. Iodide can uh, uh, be pushed out of CH3I by a chloride, like we saw earlier with a fluoride example. And there are two possible mechanisms that people have prepared, all right? In mechanism one, CH3I breaks up to CH3 plus and iodide, and then CH3 plus is super unstable because carbon likes to have four bonds, so it automatically pulls that chloride in then to make CH3Cl, CH3Cl. In the second mechanism, the CH3I directly reacts with chloride, and it makes an intermediate, which is a weird five-coordinate carbon species, which can happen for milliseconds, and that's totally unstable, so it breaks down into CH3Cl and iodide. So these are like two scientists that have proposed this, and they're fighting, all right? They want to know which is the best one. Well, we'll say then that Clifford does a rate law analysis of this reaction. And he finds that CH3I is a first order reactant, all right? Now, the other part here that's not showing is that chloride is also a reactant. But you can see that Cl minus is not listed in the rate law. So what must be the order with respect to chloride? Fluoride to order? Yeah, zero, that's right, yeah. If it doesn't appear in the ray law and it's a reactant, it's gonna be a zero order reactant. So the question is, which of these mechanisms is consistent with the ray law or can we even figure it out, okay? And the answer is, wow, look at the slow steps, all right? In the first mechanism, the slow step has just CH3I, in the second mechanism, the slow step has CH3I and Cl. What would be the predicted rate law if mechanism two would be the valid mechanism? What would be different? That'd be a Cl. Nice job. Mechanism two has two chemicals in the slow step, and each of those chemicals would be listed in the rate law. All right, so CH3I is there, but there's no Cl. All right, 
So that's probably not going to happen. On the other hand, mechanism one has just CH3i. Cl minus is part of a subsequent fast step, so it won't be part of the mechanism. So definitely here we would say mechanism one would be the one we want to go for. And it's not magic, you just look at the reactants in the slow steps. CH3I is the only reactant, there's one of them, that means we would predict this to be a first order CH3I reaction. And chloride, part of the faster step, would be a zero order reactant and won't show up. Question? All right. Mechanisms can be really cool. In organic chemistry, um, there's a lot to do with mechanisms. These are just examples of what are called SN1 and SN2. SN is an abbreviation for substitution nucleophilic, uh, and there's one and two. Unimolecular SN1 mechanism for a nucleophilic substitution reaction, the bond between the carbon and the leaving group breaks prior to formation of the bond between the carbon and the entering group. In the bimolecular SN2 mechanism for a nucleophilic substitution reaction, the formation of the bond between the carbon atom and the entering species occurs simultaneously with dissociation of the bond between the carbon and leaving group. In organic chemistry, you'll learn more about uh, what exactly happens between SN1 and SN2, uh, what's going on. <laughs> You guys doing okay back there? I'll take your silence as a yes. <laughs> Thank heavens it's Friday. A catalyst is a way to make lots of money. So if money is your thing, this would be an area to focus in on. However, in a practical level, nothing really happens in our bodies without catalysts. So they're super important. On the right hand side, we have a pathway that's not catalyzed. And you can see that this energy gap, the energy of activation is really, really high. It takes a lot of energy and that means it's slower, et cetera, et cetera. Catalysts lower the energy of activation. So you can see that this energy of activation is smaller than this value is right here. So a good catalyst literally just lowers the energy of activation. The catalyst won't affect the reactants going to products but you do see now there's two humps instead of one hump, all right? Catalysts somehow insert themselves into the reactants, and at the end, they're recreated. So catalysts will always have more than one hump, like two is very common, sometimes a lot more than two. If you just have reactants going to products, often they'll be just single steps, but you'll always see more than one step with a catalyst. In a platinum-based catalytic converter, Nitrogen monoxide molecules in the exhaust stick to the surface of the platinum. The molecule decomposes, each atom remaining on the surface. When another NO molecule comes to the area, it also decomposes, and its N atom bonds with the other N atom on the platinum surface. The O atoms also combine. The gaseous nitrogen and oxygen molecules then float away from the surface. A significant source of air pollution in many cities is the emission of nitrogen oxides by gasoline engines. The problem is not as severe as it was a few decades ago, due largely to the advent of devices called catalytic converters installed in automobile exhaust systems. Catalytic converters are a great example of catalysis. You add a certain type of transition metal. Platinum, palladium, sometimes rhodium, sometimes nickel are used. They break the NOs up into O2 and N2, which is really cool. Normally this would be a really high energy kind of process and stuff, but this time with a catalyst it becomes a lot better. There's lots of other uses. You can make plastics using some kind of catalyst. Sometimes they're paramagnetic. Uh, this is actually a big kind of a thing where the stuff winds around to make the plastic. It's pretty cool. Acetic acid comes from methanol and ethanol using some type of catalyst. And as we mentioned earlier, anything in biology that ends with an ASE is essentially a biological catalyst. They're really helpful in making our bodies do all the things that we're used to. Hydrogen peroxide in water decomposes slowly at room temperature. In the presence of manganese dioxide, however, the decomposition occurs much more rapidly. The reaction produces oxygen and water.
the manganese dioxide is not consumed or otherwise altered by the reaction. It serves only as a catalyst and makes the reaction occur more rapidly. MnO2 was a catalyst in Chem 221 when we did the potassium chlorate lab. It also decomposes H2O2. Anytime you have a catalyst, you're going to end up with more than one hump in these kind of reaction diagrams, but it will lower the energy of activation, which is really cool. So this would be H2O2 without the catalyst. This would be the H2O2 with the catalyst. Manganese is pretty cool because it can both take electrons, go from manganese plus four to manganese plus two. It can also donate electrons going from a manganese 4 to a manganese plus 7. But at the end, it's going to get those electrons back or give the electrons back whatever it has to do and end up with the right products. And fortunately, it's also pretty cheap, which is kind of nice. This is the reaction uh, that you can actually add iodine and make a cis isomer turn into a trans isomer. Now, normally, to go from cis to trans, it's 200-some kilojoules. It's really hardcore, pretty hard, pretty neat. But if you add a little bit of iodine, iodine can turn the cis into the trans form, and the iodine is recreated at the end. And they have studied this quite a bit. They feel that the iodine essentially binds to the double bond, and it essentially breaks it up, allowing then the rotation of the double bond from cis to trans, or vice versa. Uh, going to the end. So instead of, I think it's like 240 kilojoules, you've lowered it down to what they feel is about 115 kilojoules. So in the science world, that's pretty cool. And that's it for kinetics. Oh boy, all the things you wanted to know about time, but we're afraid to ask. So the last chapter we're going to look at in Chem 222 is arguably the most fun. <laughs> and fun in my world may be different from your version of fun, but it's on nuclear chemistry. And nuclear chemistry is quite a different beast from stuff we've seen before, because everything in Chem 221 and everything up to this point in Chem 222 has essentially been around the electrons and what the electrons on atom A do to the electrons on atom B, stuff like that. Well, now we're gonna go into the actual nucleus of the atoms. We're gonna see the reactions that happen with the protons and neutrons and because they're held so much tighter, the energy reactions will be quite a bit uh, more powerful too. Now in Chem 221, when we looked at the model of the atom, electrons were shimmering, if you will, around the outside, and the nucleus in the center held the protons and the neutrons. And we saw that protons were positive, electrons were negative, that's where the positive and negative cations and anions come from, stuff like that. But again, what's really interesting about this chapter is we've mostly just been focusing on those electrons. And now we're actually gonna look at what happens in the middle of the nucleus right there. The Curies, especially Marie Curie, as well as Becquerel, were the first ones to kind of see that something was happening. They found that these photographic plates, which were left next to radioactive elements, uh, were developed, <clears throat> and they didn't understand what happened, and it took a little bit of time. Becquerel came up with the idea that a ray comes out of the nucleus, so radiation, all right? Um, they explored it in quite detail, a lot of danger associated with it. Uh, Marie Curie died of cancer and stuff, which happened from her exposure to it, which is harsh. But anyway, if you know about radiative processes, you can protect yourself, and there is a lot of really interesting things you can do. Now on the periodic table, just as a quick reminder, all good periodic tables have three things. They'll have the atomic number, which is the whole number, and that's equal to the number of protons. So aluminum will always have 13 protons. If you give it an extra proton, it becomes 14, which is silicon. Take away a proton, it's number 12, which is magnesium. So the symbol, which is the second part, and the atomic number go hand in hand. If you only have the symbol, you can figure out that it's 13 protons, et cetera, et cetera. And the number we've been using mostly, of course, has been this number, it has different names, atomic weight, molar mass, grams per mole, AMU, same number, uh, which has been really cool. <clears throat> Z is the symbol given for the atomic number, number of protons, and we'll come back to that here in a little bit. 
However, all atoms have more than one isotope. And an isotope just means that you've got an atom of an element, so the Z, the number of protons, will be the same, but the number of neutrons differs. So scientists use mass number for symbol A, and the mass number literally just equals protons plus neutrons. So we talked about in Chem 221 how if you have five protons and five neutrons, you'll have a boron 10 nucleus. On the other hand, often you'll have a sample of boron with five protons and six neutrons. So five plus six would be 11. And on the periodic table for boron, the atomic number 10.811, atomic mass 10.811, that's a statistical average of 10 and 11. Like there's a lot more 11, so 10.8 is closer to 11, but you do have lots of 10. And if you had a big bag of boron, you start pulling out the atoms, you'd have boron 10s, boron 11s, but you never have boron 10.8, that's a statistical number. That's a lot of Chem 221 in about a minute. <laughs> Any questions on that? Cool. So, let's just have a quick reminder. Copper has two primary isotopes, six, copper 63 and copper 65. Which one is more abundant? Go to the periodic table. Copper is number 29. 63.546 is the number you want. Does that say, you, does that say that you're going to have more 63 or 65? 63, that's right. You can round it to the nearest value, so it's 63.5 is closer to 63 than it is 65, blah, blah, blah. Google will tell you the percent abundance of these things, which is awesome, but you can usually make a pretty good prediction. Okay. Now, because we're dealing with such a high energy type of chemistry, we're gonna see some new players on the block. So far we've seen protons, electrons, and neutrons, and we'll see those again too, but there's some new ones, and I need to introduce them here. So one thing we're gonna see in this chapter is what's called an alpha particle. An alpha particle is like a helium nucleus that's been supercharged, all right? So if you've ever been to a birthday party, they got those helium balloons and you, and you talk like a chip on right? That's ha, 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 kind of fun. But what you did that with alpha particles, you die. <laughs> so it's not fun at all, man. This is like super intense helium, all right? Actually, it doesn't even have the electrons. It's usually just positive too. The symbols for alpha particles sometimes will be written as a true helium nucleus, but often you'll see it with this symbol, which is alpha, lowercase alpha, all right? So if you hear about an alpha particle, four, two, alpha. Remember, the lower number is protons, upper number is protons plus neutrons. Most of helium is helium four, so that's what they usually represent there. Now, electrons can be cool. They will make sodium into sodium ions, chlorine into chloride. But a beta particle is another version of supercharged uh, systems. And you don't want to be messing with these electrons. These are real powerful bursts of electrons. Now, the symbol for these is either 0 minus 1 E or 0 minus 1 beta. Now, the top number kind of makes sense because protons plus neutrons equals 0 for an electron. Take it as a leap of faith for right now why there's a negative one down there. And I'll talk about that later. This is the symbol beta, and a beta particle, again, is like a supercharged electron. So that's why sometimes this is used instead of just an E. Now, this isn't technically a particle at all, but it's something we're gonna run into, and it's a gamma ray. And a gamma is a type of the EM spectrum we talked about in Chem 221, the highest energy. It's literally just pure energy. So if you see a gamma ray, gamma particle like that, that just means that something's coming off. Sometimes you'll see X-rays, which is the next highest energy, but gamma is by far the most common. Now, protons will play a factor too. So if you see a proton, well, the lower number is number of protons, and the upper number is protons plus neutrons. So 1, 1, P is very common. Hydrogen is mostly a protium, which doesn't have any neutrons, so often you'll see 1,1H one, one as well listed for it. The next one is just a neutron, all right? Neutrons are going to be players in this. 
lower number, protons, zero. Protons plus neutrons would be one. So one, zero, N is the symbol for a neutron. But I saved the best for last, a positron. Now, a positron is an anti-electron. It's literally antimatter. And I love Star Trek, as you know, and this isn't Star Trek, this is real. Antimatter is a real phenomenon. Anti-electrons look similar to regular electrons, but notice that the numbers are different. Instead of negative ones, you have positive ones right there. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Well, probably on Monday, sorry. There's a nuclear chemistry guide, uh, which goes over all of this stuff, which is pretty interesting. Um, this is just a cheesy little picture here showing a hydrogen atom and an anti-hydrogen atom. And you can have electrons and protons in normal hydrogen. You can have a positron, an anti-electron, and an anti-proton in an anti-hydrogen atom. I think I'm going to let you think about this over the weekend stuff. Uh, do know that I'm looking forward to your class presentations today at 1 o'clock for those of you who have today. Any questions? Have a great day.